So what we're going to try to do in this video is take a look at something that is going to pop up every now and again in calculus that's known as an oscillating function. And this is going to be a video where we don't use the definition of a limit. Uh, we're going to rely on our graphing calculator here a little bit to help us out. So this is just kind of after you've been introduced to limits for the first time, you're evaluating with graphs, you're evaluating them with tables, just a little bit of a discussion as to how to really come to understand what one of these oscillating functions actually is and why the, the limit of this oscillating function is what we say it is uh, by the end of this video. So this is from a calculus textbook and <clears throat> we're checking the limit as x approaches zero of the function sine of one over x. Now if you wanted to evaluate this limit uh, with a graph, what you could do is you could graph this on the calculator, make sure you're in radian mode. And I think I've manipulated my window settings a little bit here. I'm just looking negative one to positive one in both directions. And we see a graph that looks like this. So if you're trying to do the limit as you approach zero, you look at this graph and it, it seems like it's kind of weird looking in here toward zero. Uh, we're gonna have to be careful with what we say a limit is graphically when we're dealing with a calculator. What we're going to want to rely on here is going to be the, the table of values. So if we look at the table settings, we want our calculator to start the table for us at zero. Uh, we want the jump in our table to be pretty tiny. One one thousandth is going to be just fine. And if you look at the table, our function is undefined at zero. For these x's that are bigger than zero, we see something kind of weird. We see 0.3, we see negative 0.4, we see 0.8. Uh, on the other side of zero, we see the opposites of those values. From the smaller side of zero, we have y values of negative 0.3, positive 0.4, and negative 0.8. So this is kind of weird. Usually when we look at a table and uh, we're trying to evaluate the limit on our calculator or with the graph, we see it a pretty obvious progression toward one value or another. Maybe it's because uh, the jump in the table isn't small enough. So maybe I'll, rather than looking at values that are one one thousandth apart, maybe I'll look at values that are one ten thousandth apart. So if I add another zero and make sure my table continues to start at the x value of zero, uh, maybe we'll figure out the answer to this now. And if we look at what we have on both sides is zero. We see negative 0.1, negative 0.9. So this is pretty close to zero, and this is really close to negative one. Uh, and then we're kind of halfway in between the two. And, and same thing happens here. We just have positive values. For x's that are slightly smaller than zero, we see a number close to zero, a number close to one, and then a number that's kind of more in between zero and one. So seems kind of weird. I want to talk about this expression and what happens with 1 over x as x approaches 0. So as x approaches 0 from the bigger side, what I want to do is I want to just kind of list a table here. Well, that wasn't a very straight table, but I think it'll do what we need it to do. In this column, I'm going to list the value of x we're considering. And in this column, I'm going to list what 1 over x actually equals. This number is pretty close to zero, one one thousandth. Uh, if we were to try and figure out what one over this x is, one over one one thousandth, what we actually get out of this is rather than dividing one by this fraction, multiply one by the reciprocal of this fraction. And the reciprocal of this fraction would be one thousand over one. So this is equivalent to one times one thousand over one, which equals one thousand. What happens if you let x get even closer to zero, but stay on the bigger side of zero? So rather than one one thousandth, let's go one ten thousandth. We're going to be able to compute one over x do, by doing the same thing. Rather than dividing one by this value of x, let's multiply one by the reciprocal of this x. So the reciprocal would be ten thousand over one. One times ten thousand over one gives us ten thousand. And if you do the same thing with a number that's even closer to zero than one ten thousandth, if you did this with one one hundred thousandth, what you're going to end up with as the value of this fraction, the value of one over x, is you're going to end up with one hundred thousand. So hopefully what you're realizing by going down through this little table here is the closer we let x get to zero, 
the bigger and bigger one over x actually becomes, right? We let x get closer and closer to zero in this column. We see bigger and bigger positive values in this column. Now, what happens if we were going to do a table for values that are slightly smaller than zero? Well, all that changes is we make all these numbers negative, and then all of these results end up being negative. So what happens is when x gets closer and closer to zero from the smaller side, we see values of 1 over x that are actually decreasing further and further. They're getting really, 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 really negative, right? Negative 1,000, negative 10,000, negative 100,000. So what does that mean with regard to this entire function? We've just been focusing on 1 over x for the last couple minutes. If we think about sine of all these values, the sine of 1,000, the sine of 10,000, even the sine of negative 1,000, the sine of negative 10,000, uh, what's going to end up happening is you're going to be trying to evaluate the sine function at this number, this number, 100,000, negative 1,000, negative 10,000, negative 100,000. The closer and closer you get to zero on this function, if you use the graph of sine of x, Sine of 1,000 would be way, way out here on the x-axis. Sine of 100,000 would be even further to the right on the x-axis, right? This graph continues. Right? You've seen sine wave before. This graph is just going to continue, and that's a bad attempt at continuing it. But this graph is just going to continue. You know you're going to be you know, way over here on the x-axis, and you're going to be somewhere in between negative 1 and positive 1 for your value of sine of 1,000. You're going to be somewhere between negative 1 and and positive 1 for your value of sine of 100,000. This graph goes back this direction too, right? This graph continues back this way. So if you're evaluating sine of negative 1,000, you're going to be somewhere between negative 1 and positive 1. You don't know exactly where. Same thing for sine of negative 10,000. You're going to be somewhere between negative 1 and positive 1. You just don't know exactly where. So the value of this function right here, this sine of 1 over x, is always going to be between negative 1 and 1. But the weird thing about this graph is the closer we get to zero, the further and further out on this graph we have to go either direction in order to figure out where our result for this function actually would sit. If we go and look at the calculator here one more time, I don't know why it disappeared. We'll get it back up here. If we look at this graph, and rather than letting my x min and x max go from negative 1 to positive 1. Let's say that I looked at a very, very detailed picture of this graph really close to the origin. What we should see happening here when we hit the graph button is we should see this graph is actually bouncing up and down quite a bit. And you do see this is negative 1 1,000th. 1, this is positive 1 1,000th. 1, this function, sine of 1 over x, is bouncing up and down like crazy between negative 1 and 1 because the closer we let x get to 0, whether it's the, the negative side as we have in the table right now or the positive side as we had in that table initially, we're having to evaluate sine of 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, or negative of those values. And that's going to cause us to have a graph that's known as an oscillating function or a function that's known as an oscillating function. The graph is bouncing up and down like crazy really close to this x value. And when a graph exhibits this sort of behavior, uh, we say that the limit doesn't exist. And again, this is called an oscillating function. The limit here does not exist because the function, although it's going to be between negative 1 and 1, it's going to keep bouncing up and down or oscillating uh, between those two values and never approach one specific value. And again, the name for this type of function is called an oscillating function. Kind of a weird function. You'll see it every now and then in uh, a calculus course. And the reason why you discuss this type of function with regard to limits is because limits are around to let us do things in math that we couldn't previously do. And this is something that would have been tough to, to really figure out uh, without a limit in place. And like I said, we're not going to deal with the definition of the limit at all in this video. This is just to kind of discuss why an oscillating function is an oscillating function and why the limit doesn't exist. We see the graph bounce up and down between negative 1 and 1, but we don't approach one specific value.